hello to everyone. Thank you for introduction. My name is Mateusz and I am a PhD student at AGH here in Krakow. And I will be talking to you today about uh, part of my, uh, my research, my PhD studies, uh, which is uh, desynchronized information propagation for uh, very scalable simulations. Uh, and to start properly, uh, I should, I think, describe uh, what I uh, consider a complex simulation in this context. Uh, so I will be talking about simulations that try to uh, reproduce some real life phenomenon, uh, like artificial life, like some, some biological or trafical simulation. And uh, by trying to uh, by trying to use it to represent it as some mathematical model. Uh, and of course, as with all things in computer science, uh, the more accuracy we need, the more computational power we need. Uh, and that's why we need to try to parallelize the simulations. It's of course the most common way to increase performance. Uh, we get more computational power because we have multiple cores. Uh, we get more memory because we have multiple virtual machines, computational nodes, and HPC environments are getting more and more uh, popular, accessible nowadays. Uh, we have, for example, Prometheus here in Krakow. However, it is not that easy to parallelize the simulation because the simulation has uh, several features uh, that make it uh, intrinsically uh, hard to parallelize. Uh, the first and most important uh, difficulty is that uh, the decision that the simulation is uh, taking at every step is often based on some neighborhood. And when we divide the grid between workers, between computational nodes, uh, we need to look into the part of the state that is stored in our neighbor node, which is, of course, working against uh, distribution. And the second one is that the simulation steps uh, have to be computed sequentially. So we kind of have to wait uh, before the, all, all other nodes finish the computations for a given step before we can start another one. And to address these problems, uh, Sinuk framework was created and it was presented a year ago at Lambda Days by uh, David Dvorak and Jakub Buyas. And, uh, I highly recommend to you to go and check their talk from the year before. Uh, the main goal of this framework is to allow running uh, grid-based simulations in distributed environments. Uh, so to make this possible, uh, we enforce uh, grid state creation, so the main logic, uh, decision making, which is another part of the general logic of the simulation and uh, collection of metrics of the simulation, uh, we leave it to the user to implement, while the, the framework will be handling communication, grid distribution, and all of the parts that we would have to write again and again for each simulation to run it uh, in distributed matter, manner. Uh, this is the very, very general architecture of uh, this framework, so we can uh, create uh, or rather allocate several computational nodes, uh, execute uh, one act worker actor on each node, or more than one actor, actually. Uh, each actor contains a part of the grid of this simulation, and all actors are sequentially, or rather each actor sequentially processes his part of the grid, and when it's needed, communicates with other actors on his node or on neighboring nodes. Uh, the technology used to create this framework uh, is better described in this uh, presentation I mentioned before, presentation of Jakub and David, and I highly recommend you to check if you want to know some more details uh, about the, the technology uh, used. Uh, generally, they used all the features of Scala and Akka that uh, facilitate uh, distribution, uh, use, use of uh, multiple cores, multiple nodes. So the cluster sharding, which uh, helps resolve uh, addresses and root messages, actor system to uh, generally uh, process these messages, 
and uh, multi-platform support because Scala can be uh, run everywhere the JVM is running. Uh, and this framework utilizes two main features that allow it to uh, generally distribute the simulation at all. Uh, the first technique is uh, signal propagation, which is closely based on the smell propagation from real life. Uh, so in this example, we can have some task, which in this context, uh, for example, might be a piece of food laying on the grid. And in each iteration step, this, uh, this task, this food, will emit some signal, some smell, which will propagate through the board. And it is guaranteed that uh, each part of the board that has access to this task, that can find a way to this task, will in some time receive some part of this smell. It, can, it is, of course, uh, weaker with the distance. Uh, and basing on this signal, basic on this, these values, an actor that would be, for example, lying in one of the cells, take this for example, uh, will know that in his cell, and basic only on his own cell, uh, he knows that smell comes from the right side. So in this simulation step, he would know that uh, he probably wants to go to the right cell. From this cell, he would deduct that uh, to the top right uh, is the source of the smell, and in the next step, he would reach uh, the goal, the piece of food to be eaten, for example, uh, and all of these decisions were based only, only using his own cell, the cell he was standing in. So there is no communication in this part of simulation involved. Uh, the second feature uh, that helps uh, reduce the communication between nodes is uh, the introduction of buffer zone. Uh, each worker, uh, additionally to his own uh, grid part, which is uh, the part uh, with dashed line. Uh, he has some parts, for example, this, this gray part, uh, that mimic, that map, uh, not this button, uh, that uh, map some part of the neighboring worker grid. So if logic in this worker, in this grid, would decide that some actor tries to move outside of his grid, uh, it would end up in this buffer zone and in next, uh, synchronization step, the whole zone would be sent to the neighboring worker and incorporated into his, uh, his own grid. Uh, Jakub and David uh, did uh, a lot of performance tests and they have got really, really good results. Uh, for example, running the same problem, they reduced, uh, pro they reduced uh, the execution time from eight and a half hour uh, to 11 minutes by going from 72 to over 3,000 cores, and uh, by keeping the same size of problem for each processor, they uh, increased the size of the problem by two orders of magnitude, uh, while increasing the, the execution time by only less than a half. Uh, and these charts uh, generally show you that uh, the work of each core is generally on the same level, not exactly the same. We have some uh, higher and lower points, but generally we can deduct that uh, this framework could be scaled even more. But all of this they have shown in their uh, presentation. Uh, what I am interested in is whether the distribution of the grid doesn't make it, uh, make the simulation run something different from the single core. Uh, if we divide the grid, if we base our uh, decisions on our part, if we synchronize state, if we resolve conflicts that arise from synchronizing state, does the simulation do the same under the, the circumstances? Well, uh, I took all the models that they created for testing and, uh, and presenting their uh, framework, uh, namely the fire emergency evacuation where we have uh, fire spreading throughout the building, people running away from the fire and trying to reach the exits. Uh, foraminifera habitat, uh, which is a group of single cell organisms that uh, feed on plankton, live on the, the sea 
the bottom of the sea, and the final one, a simple predator and prey scenario uh, with rabbits chasing the lettuce and, and devouring it. And the question is uh, like that. Does this simulation run on single core calculate the same which uh, this simulation does running on 16 cores? Are the results the same? Well, it looks so, but does it really run the same? Uh, so I created some uh, experiment plan. Uh, I took all three models. For each model, I created four parameter sets. Uh, each parameter set would end with uh, different uh, simulation scenario, different results. Uh, I created one, four, nine, and 16 worker setups. And each of these setups I run 30 times to collect statistical samples. And here is the harder part. Uh, this is part of my results. Uh, how to read this chart? Uh, maybe I should start. Uh, each group of bars represents one configuration, one parameter set of uh, the simulation. Uh, each bar in the set represents one, four, nine, and 11 workers. And uh, each bar is uh, representing quartiles, so the, uh, the lowest uh, value, the highest value, the uh, center value, and so on. And in the ideal scenario, we should see four groups of identical bars. Of course, if we take into consideration that uh, the simulation is a bit random, uh, we should see four sets of very similar bars. And this is the case in this uh, in this, uh, in this chart, uh, we can see that uh, the matrix uh, is, of course, the people deaths. So we can see that this variant has led to significantly more deaths in this simulation and to significantly less uh, people escapes. So uh, we can see that uh, the variant two uh, is consistently, no matter how many workers, producing the similar results. If we look at the uh, charts that show the same metric, but per iteration, uh, we can see that again, uh, in the same configuration, so this is the first, second, third, and fourth uh, set of parameters, uh, the lines are overlapping, but we can see differences between these configurations. So this one ended around the 100th iteration, the same for this one, this ended around the 50th, and this one around 70th simulation. So uh, we can see that, uh, again, the general tendencies of the parameter sets are staying the same no matter how many workers it is run on. Uh, the same goes for the second type of uh, simulation, for aminifera habitat. Uh, we can see that each of the parameter sets have, has really different values. Uh, the difference is uh, significant. We can see slight differences between the configuration, uh, the, between the worker numbers, but comparing to the difference between the values of uh, this metric in parameter sets, we can see that this difference is negligible. And the same is true for the per iteration charts. Uh, the first two setups led to complete extinction of the population. Uh, the third one led to stable population. And the last one caused population to run in uh, this sinusoidal uh, pattern. So, basic on these charts, we can say that we achieved our goal. We have a framework that uh, not only runs our simulations faster, not only leads to better performance, but also doesn't impact significantly the results of the simulation. Well, it would seem so. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the results for the rabbits and lettuce uh, simulation uh, weren't completely crazy. And I have an answer already why this happened. Uh, this simulation was implemented in very naive matter, a manner. Uh, so, the, the person that was responsible for uh, writing the code of merging the buffer zone with the 
target grid, grid of target worker, uh, allowed the simulation to perform something that's normally illegal. So when uh, the buffer zone contains a rabbit and the same cell in the worker grid contains a rabbit, uh, one rabbit would eat another. And this is uh, something that could not happen in a single worker scenario. And as we can see, it caused this little snowball effect where ah, for the beginning uh, they were the same and then everything started to differ completely and in the end we have absolutely different values. Uh, so the conclusions of this, uh, this little research uh, is that we did in fact create uh, the framework that does not introduce uh, the discrepancies in the results by itself. However, uh, unfortunately, we could not relieve the user from thinking. Uh, the user still has to know that uh, the simulation is run in parallel. Uh, they have to know that the simulation is distributed, that the grid is split between <coughs> workers, and they will have to take it into consideration while, while writing the model. And that's everything I had to say for now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and we have time for some questions. Okay, there is one over there. My question is short. Uh, what about tests? Uh, excuse you, me, I can't hear you. Uh, what about tests? Do you have some test 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 kit or something that uh, allows you to uh, prove that uh, your uh, algorithm is? Uh, free of bugs, for example, as as you mentioned, the the the, the, the buffer buffer thing. Uh, do you mean the unit tests yeah, of, for the, example, yeah. of the uh, simulation scenario of the yeah, for, for, model? The, for for a single 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 piece of grid for, for the single node, uh, how it behaves? Well, uh, the simulation is undeterministic, so it's kind of hard to uh, predict what will happen. Uh, it's the nature of simulation in this case that uh, we don't know what should be effect of simulation. Uh, in fact, I had to compare the simulations uh, with within different setups uh, because I didn't know what should be the proper result. I can imagine that every every simulation you should uh, should be able you should be able to verify if the result is proper, even calculating by by hand. But uh, you, you should have, have to you, you should have possibility to to say is this, is this proper 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 result or not. You can. You shouldn't be like. Well, I have to believe. Uh, well, generally, uh, yes, you can very, very generally say that this uh, this simulation should be, should behave this way, and uh, unfortunately, uh, for example, all of these behaviors are the correct behavior of this simulation. Uh, unfortunately, I I could have uh, if I implemented it uh, in the wrong way. I could have, uh, for example, this behavior for single worker and this behavior for 16 workers. So both results are correct. Unfortunately, I don't know which one is the proper one for this case, at least. Okay, there is one more question here. Yeah. Um, do you think that it's possible to find some stable properties? Okay, the, the result is, the, is not deterministic because it's a simulation, but you think that it can make sense to find some properties that are testable? Well, uh, I didn't find it yet. Uh, I was, into, was, was trying to find some way to uh, test it in other way, in more uh, predictable way. Uh, however, that's all I had uh, in mind at the time. At least. Yeah, I think both of these questions are a bit about reproducibility. Yeah? It's an important kind of uh, issue in all scientific computing or simulations that you would like to reproduce yeah? the experiment that somebody else or maybe yourself did before. Yeah? And, uh, uh, maybe and the even if with random numbers you can use the same seed to start the random generator or something like that. So. Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic for, for future work. I well, guess. Uh, maybe <laughs> a better answer to your question would be that uh, probably I could uh, devise much simpler uh, simulation that would be much more deterministic. And that, that would uh, help me a bit 
Uh, in fact, I did it. However, it was too simple to observe any, any, any interesting behavior. Okay. If we have no more questions, we should thank our speaker again.